Hi, and welcome to our presentation, uh, Changing the Art Education Landscape, Rewind Fast Forward. This is our third version of this presentation, so thank you for coming. Um, we have, over the years, modified it and recrafted it as we've gone through COVID, and so uh, we are here now to talk to you about the future and, uh, and the past and where we think we're going in art education. My name is Elizabeth, I go by Lisa Stewart, and I am the visual arts supervisor for Prince George's County Public Schools. And I'll turn it over to Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Filer wonder I'm a professor of art education at Kutztown University and currently the interim associate dean for the College of Visual and Performing Arts. Thanks for being with us today or listening to our recording. And James. Um, James Reese, I just retired a year ago from 30 years in the high school classroom uh, teaching art. I currently teach as an adjunct visiting professor at Brigham Young University teaching graduate courses to a group of future teachers. Uh, glad to be here. Great, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started with my section. Uh, again, my name is Lisa. And my section is all about how I support teachers as the visual arts supervisor. So you're gonna hear kind of the voice of the teachers in, in my uh, section of this presentation. So, like I said, I am the visual arts supervisor. I work in a very large school system right outside of Washington, DC. You see that on the map on the right. Um, Prince George's County Public Schools has 130,000 students. We have 24 high schools, uh, 280 art teachers I help and support throughout their teaching. And like I said, we are right outside of Washington, D.C. in Maryland. And the uh, map here in yellow shows you that we are a very kind of long school system. So to get from all the way at the top to all the way at the bottom takes about an hour and a half. And then if you add in D.C. traffic, it makes it much, much worse. So that's a little bit about my school system. So I'm gonna take you a little bit on a, on a rewind, going back in time a little bit um, to talk about what art education looked like either in the pandemic or even before the pandemic. Um, and so just to, to, to share a little bit about um, that past, there we were in COVID, um, so that was a really challenging time. And one of the things that we noticed was that during that time, we got to rip off the technology band-aid really, really fast. We all had to figure out how we were going to have meetings online, how we were going to teach online. Um, and so uh, you know, I'm sure all of you remember if you were teaching during that time, how challenging and difficult that was. Um, and then to go back even further, when I was uh, in the classroom and, and teaching, we spent a lot of time uh, looking in the, looking back in the past. Uh, our projects were by artist. And so I spent a lot of time looking at Claude Monet and having our students create work of art that were was inspired by Claude Monet, which in turn made for a lot of cookie cutter lessons. So our lessons, in the past where students were creating something and every lesson looked very, very similar. Every work of art that the students created looked very similar. And so you might hang up a display and all the student work might have a little bit of variation here and there, but pretty much look very much the same. Uh, also in the past, we created lessons that were kind of this one size fits all. There was not much in the way of differentiating our lessons. And so um, differentiation uh, was not a word that I learned when I was going through college. Um, and so we ended up creating a lesson that could be taught to a room full of 25 and 30 kids. And that was just that one lesson and not much variation or change based on their different abilities. Um, I felt that back when I was teaching, there was grading that was kind of more arbitrary. It was kind of like, there was no rubrics, there was no standards that was aligned to how you were grading. 
Um, there was standards, but it wasn't uh, the same way that it is now where you have to kind of think about in advance, how are you going to grade the students? You share that information with the students before you even start teaching the lesson. And so um, that was not the case back, back in the day. Um, cell phones was kind of not a thing back in the day either that we had to deal with. Uh, and so um, even now, I think we've gotten a lot better with figuring out how to incorporate cell phones and technology into our instruction. Um, if you're, any of you are familiar with chat GPT, I feel like that's the next new cell phone hurdle is to kind of figure out how are we going to incorporate AI technology into our instruction. It's one of those things where if we don't embrace it, the students are, are going to use it anyway, so we better figure out how to incorporate it. And then I feel like actually back in the day, this is something I'd like to figure out how to fast forward and put into our future. I felt like I had more flexibility in media options um, and things that I was seeing my teachers being able to do back in the day. I used to make paper with my students. I used to do all kinds of like really kind of out there projects. And now I feel like... Um, our teachers focus predominantly on painting, drawing, ceramic sculpture, printmaking, and not much else, right? And so making sure that they get in those major projects. But um, I feel like we kind of don't have as much flexibility in media options as we used to. So to fast forward, um, I wanna share a video that my teachers created. They were gracious enough and I thank them tremendously for putting together these small snippets of where they think education should go in the future. So they were asked to answer a question um, to list two things that they think schools should have or students should have in their schools moving forward. So this is about five minutes. So you can hear the voice of the teachers and where we should be going. Hey, I'm Elvin Twine. Been teaching here at Parkdale High School for 30 years. I think one major thing uh, the kids will benefit from is um, broadening access to vocational training. I've ran into so many kids at the graduation that have become uh, great uh, electrician, mechanics, uh, carpenters. Um, so having that more available for uh, more of our students, I think would uh, benefit. Hello, my name is Jennifer. And two things I think schools should have going forward are large visual screens for visual aids for students to see education in action, live, moving in full color, and also technology platforms where students are able to hands-on engage digitally with the education they're being exposed to in live real time. Therefore, that means fast, high speeds internet, high speed internet, and also, like I said before, some form of technology a screen, uh, a computer, iPad, some type of monitor uh, that's large enough for students to visualize and interact hands-on with the education they're being exposed to. That's the future of education, whether it be 3D printer or um, some type of technology where students are building robots and coding, HTML, Python, other forms of technology exposing students to the future of education. Hello, my name is Dave Wong, and schools moving forward should have adequate space and up-to-date technologies. I'm Anthony Clayman, and while I believe there are many things our schools could do better, we have a fundamental problem in the United States that makes meaningful change impossible. Simply, we don't have an education problem in the United States, at least not a serious one. We have a poverty problem. We're asking our schools to solve the results of inequity and poverty. And simply put, teachers are not social workers. Hi, my name is Mark Arcusa from Bowie High School. Two things that I think students need that we should have in all schools going forward is access to better, more healthy foods and a place for them to work out or meditate or do yoga or someplace to decompress during the school day. I think that would greatly improve the climate and help out with a lot of issues that we have with behavior and all kinds of things. I think that um, 
It's a very good Michelle Davis Robinson. And what you're viewing is a collection of fourth grade student artwork. I think all schools need a very strong visual art department that services all the students along with some entity in the schoolhouse that bridges the art department to counseling and student behavior. So students are able to express themselves uh, in more than one way because sometimes it's very difficult for people to say how they feel using words. Hi, my name is Leanna James, and two things that I think all schools need going forwards are creative and performing arts programs and two educators in every classroom, one to teach and one to guide. Hello, my name is Barbara Joanne Combs, and two things schools should have going forward are properly maintained, age-appropriate playgrounds, and fully equipped art classrooms. Both help children with the development of motor, language and social skills, decision-making, risk-taking, and inventiveness. Hello, my name is Christina Kunz. Two things I think schools should have going forward are arts integration activities incorporated into all subjects and art education for all grade levels and abilities. No child should go without an art education. Hi, I'm Sarah. Two things I think schools should have going forward are resources that match specific student populations and reform safety measures. My name is Elena Gaston Nicolas. Art integration, interdisciplinary projects, and feedback and collaboration between the whole educational community are the two main things a school should have to move forward. Thank you. Okay, hold on one second. I have to figure out how to get back to, there we go. All right, so thank you so much uh, to my teachers who um, took the time out. Like I said, uh, they they are truly amazing and it was really interesting to hear what each of them had to say. Um, and in a, in a, James is also gonna share what the students' voices are and what I wanted to kind of point out is that there are some similar over overlaps. So James, when you get to your part, make sure you kind of point out some of those things because it's really interesting to see that teachers and students are um, on similar pages when it comes to what uh, uh, schools need moving forward. So um, some other ideas uh, that teachers shared with me that I want to discuss uh, is uh, emotional learning. I think that that's one of the things that is here to stay, that we're looking at those social emotional skills and making sure that we're incorporating that into our instruction moving forward. And I, I think we're kind of at a beginning stage of this. I think that we're gonna see this grow further and further as we go along. Um, collaborating with the industry looking at ways that we can look forward into future jobs and um, bring in some of those industry professionals into our schools. Um, soft skills like uh, behavior management and teaching kids how to verbalize their needs. Um, working again with the emotional learning and, and helping our students work through their anxiety in their school, in their schools and, and, um, that they're having in their everyday life, I think will be another important skill for us to incorporate. Um, extra supports for our students. Uh, arts integration, you heard that through the um, video. Several people talked about arts integration. Um, how we can use art to support social emotional learning. What was interesting was uh, that teachers are actually an advocates for metal detectors. I don't know if that's um, moving forward, but it made me realize that we have a lot of um, staff out there and I think students are as well scared right now. And so how can we combat and deal with some of that, that that's happening uh, 
I know we're spending a whole lot of time on lockdown drills. Um, and so a lot more than when I was a teacher. So, um, you know, I just, that kind of goes to where we are right now, I think in the country um, and what's happening in our schools. Smaller class sizes, there's definitely a, a need and an urge for how can we figure out how to get, have those smaller class sizes. And I think it's because we want to spend more one-on-one -on -one time with our students. And what does that provide when we are only have 12 students in a class or 15 students in a class? And then um, uh, teachers also wanted to see more parent and guardian involvement. And so are those things that we can make mandatory or how can we um, involve our parents more deeply? They also, my teachers listed some new class offering ideas that they have, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so take a look here and you see if you see any uh, new class offerings that one, maybe your schools already provide or two, something that you could bring back and say, that would be a really great idea. We should have a gardening club. We should have an astronomy club, right? Because sometimes new class offerings start with a club and they get so uh, popular that we figure out how to incorporate them within the student day. And then just for, for me to end, I just wanted to share a project uh, that my um, students have been doing here in Prince George's County. We were able to offer one-to-one -one iPad Pros with an Apple Pencil and a keyboard to um, our high school graphics and media arts programs. And so we're really proud of this program and the fact that we're able to kind of break down the silos of being in four walls of a classroom um, and, and kids are able to go outside and draw and work together and be out in the environment to create art. Uh, and so I just wanted to share a little bit about that project and the fact that our teachers are becoming Apple certified teachers um, and all that that's able to provide with some extra professional development. Um, and so it's a, a really nice positive um, project that we've been able to do in Prince George's County. Um, okay, so now we're going to hear from James. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And I will be sure to pull in the similarities and the overlapping areas between teachers and students because I was a little surprised that there were quite a few points in where they shared because often we think in the classroom as a teacher, we don't, we're not on the same page. But it clearly, uh, some things and themes emerged that shown common concerns and areas and directions they'd like to see education go. So that's great. Um, a little bit about me. I uh, currently teach at a university. I have on and off over the 30 years that I taught. Um, I am a classroom teacher. That's where I live and breathe in the high school. And, uh, and I tried to implement what I thought were contemporary practice in the classroom uh, from the very beginning. But of course, that always is a moving target in trying to uh, do the very best contemporary practices as a teacher that will connect and make it uh, applicable to my students, uh, not only in the present, but hopefully in their future creative endeavors. So um, I thought I'd talk a little bit, here's my rewind portion, which I'm gonna hit a lot, is um, understanding where we are, we need to understand where we've been in regards not only to education, but into art education specifically. Art education really had its um, tie early on, a very integral uh, public schools started with closed-ended mechanical drawing was implemented, kind of taught as a science in 1800s. And then in 1821, it was first introduced to public school as uh, taking care of a need of architectural designers uh, during the Industrial Revolution. It wasn't until almost 120 years afterward Victor Lowenfeld introduced art education as a focus for the holistic nature of, of a child and as a human, humanizing and therapeutic activity to help um, kids explore freedom of expression. 
And then in the 1960s, we had a back to basic where the experimental um, child center approaches moved to more of a body of knowledge and more of a discipline centered educational model within the arts. And then um, later on in, in 1962, the Central uh, Min Midwestern Regional Educational Laboratory uh, introduced curriculum that uh, started educational research as an aesthetic educational program started then. And then you can see here where we ramp up into the 1970s uh, with familiar tab, uh, discipline art education in the 1980s. I believe Amy said to discuss that. And again, that really, you can see the foundation and where these things began. Visual, cultural, and uh, diversity uh, being an exploration in, the, in 2000. And then uh, the National Core Standards, uh, believe it or not, were just introduced in 2014. And then enter in COVID. And I, I think uh, Lisa talked a little bit about where we kind of backstepped a little bit to the the standards I notice uh, in the arenas where I operated on the uh, NAEA board and also within my own school district and state where because of the pragmatic nature of being able to ha have students hand in assignments that were easily um, graded, uh, submitted online, more pragmatic approaches of art entered into uh, the, the school. So we kind of stepped back from the National Core Standards. I saw that just because the pragmatic scanning, reading through a rubric and giving uh, feedback back was easier with those kind of hands-on approaches. So let's move forward um, and see where things were going. Um, I'm gonna pull from my students and also I'm going to share a recent um, article, uh, re uh, program, sorry, a report from this, uh, the uh, Educational Commission of States that analyzes and looks at funding and policy across all the states and the governor's addresses and where things are going. Because I think obviously attitudes with funding and policies will really shape the future of education. So I'll look at that as well. So here I have, uh, prior to retiring, I asked my students an open-ended question is what would your ideal educational experience consist of. You all think things could be better. You complain about things. What would you make sure you included? If you were in charge, what are one or two things that you would make sure you would include in your education? I, as a side note, I also had them construct uh, architectural models of this ideal school, but I'm not sharing those here. Um, I would implement a preparatory life experience class where we would learn how to do things out of high school, like instead of learning the unit circle in high school, we would learn how to apply for a loan and like who you would talk to for that and who you would talk to for buying a house or like just learning how to do stuff out of high school. Hi, I'm McKenna, and this is my recipe for improving our schools. I personally think that a big part of schools should be um, making sure that the students have the help they need for their mental health and also educating students on how to get help and how to help others with their mental health or how to help others get the help that they need. So my ideal school would be uh, pretty much flexible schedule for everybody especially for seniors. I want schools to be able to find a more progressive way to get students mental health resources and just general health resources. Top things I would change for school would be a more interactive environment with the other students and the teachers. My ideal school would be to focus more on the future of technology and the future of sports. Um, I think schools will be better if we start later and we have better quality food because then kids won't be so tired throughout the day and hungry. Um, I think schools should have healthier food options and shorter school days because then we can pay attention better in class and be more awake and do our work and be healthy. My, <laughs> my idea for a school would to have, be to have 
study rooms for students and to have meditation centers for students to relax. Yeah, let me see. I'll Do I introduce it. myself or? No, nope, that, okay. that's doing it. Okay, go for it. All right, so the two things that I have to talk about is uh, mental health. I think counselors do a great job, but they're just juggling a lot with like kids' schedules and uh, like getting emails out. So I think having like mental health counselors is a big, it could help uh, in a big way just to all the students. And then another one is um, better meals. I feel like uh, it doesn't have to be like better in a way that, that like kids want it, but like kids need like they need good, better vegetables, like, instead of just processed food, they can, like... Two things I think would make a good school would be, first, more hands-on learning. Um, during school, we tend to sit more in classrooms. That gets really boring. I think um, gaining experience would be more important than just sitting, listening to a teacher talk, and then forget about it maybe a year later. So, um, two of the reasons that I had for my school was, um, one of them was no required classes, and another the one was to have more programs for different careers, and... We just adjust. Okay, alright, two things I think that would improve schooling is having uh, the ability to create your own schedule, because I think, uh, like, having the ability to choose how you want your education is important, and you can... Um, take the classes that you need for your interests. Um, another thing I also think is classes that help you apply and interview for jobs because you're going to need a job in the future and I think that's a useful skill you could have. Great, so some interesting emerging themes came out that some of which I was a little surprised. Uh, but here are the top things that they were talking about. Student ownership, I think during COVID, the flexibility of the schedule, sometimes it was taken advantage of, but other students really liked the flexibility of being able to incorporate education in a rhythm and a manner that uh, they wanted. Uh, improvement of curriculum, that, um, that's an ongoing thing, right? Better training teachers, Amy will talk about that. Um, uh, uh, social emotional learning is a big one. And I'll talk about also that the governor's report a lot of funding went into physical improvement in education and emotional mental improvement. So a lot of funds and policies in place to um, echo and support what uh, our students have been saying here. And then real world application. Again, uh, they want, you know, one of them talked to me about, you know, algebra is great, but boy, I'd love to know how to balance a budget. I want something that will stay with me for the rest of my life that will really pragmatically be something that would be beneficial. So um, interesting that the governor's uh, report, again, generally of this, uh, the, these, this report of the Educational uh, Commission of States, uh, they are putting money behind CTE and other real world experiences. They want students to come prepared to enter into the workforce and those that are wanting to, to, uh, to a higher edu education, they're also funding in support of that. So pragmatic application of educational practices, uh, that is a trend and funding these types of classes are something that um, current governmental agencies, uh, governors across the United States are seeing as very important. So real world application. And then interconnectivity, I'll talk a little bit about some interesting things and trends in some schools, Elon Musk's school in particular, has some interesting maybe potential uh, legs for maybe where we might be able to steal some of those ideas in and, in, and moving in that direction about having students engage in more teamwork and uh, game kind of like playing to uh, acquire critical thinking skills. So um, students want ownership. They want the freedom. They, I think they want, and it's something I use a term often is schoolish. When something is uh, abstractly only real and you in the walls of a classroom, but outside don't have, doesn't have any application, students frown upon that. And they want some degree to be able to choose within the constraints of a class schedule or within the curriculum. They want to be able to uh, 
choose more depth and breadth. Uh, teachers can do this in a lot of different ways. I try to provide alternative ways for students to fulfill the assignments. And uh, so, you know, choice of two or three uh, ways that they could fulfill and learn the same things. Uh, students are very responsive to that approach. That gives them a sense of choice and ownership and uh, they're more engaged. One of the projects I've been doing over the years with my students is we ran a gallery and students were the ones that selected what shows they wanted to run and they voted on it. Often um, my students would break up a class of 40. We'd have teams of three to four students uh, create an idea and that would eventually turn over the classroom to the idea that was voted upon by all the class, uh, what they thought would be a good idea for a exhibit. And that we would, they would turn, I would turn over the classroom to them to drive the project that eventually would find its way onto a gallery and sometimes museums. So this time of uh, engagement is not only being real world, but is turning over the reins and, and of choice and control into the hands of students where they can problem solve and be more engaged. Um, improved curriculum. Um, we still, I think in all of our educational experiences, we, we know those teachers um, that to show videos all the time or handouts. I even had one teacher that would still be using an overhead projector uh, transparency. For those of you that don't know what that are, that is because you're so young, um, I'm so glad to hear that. But the rest of us kind of know those people that have been teaching the same way over and over and they don't engage the students because their curriculum doesn't shift to their uh, their needs. They need to, they need to, um, be making works and be exposed to artists that are defying traditional media as well. And that they're exploring new ways of doing things. It's great to learn about Van Gogh, but we need to have students also exposed to Art 21's full gamut of, of artists that think outside the box using new media. Here's an example of uh, my students and students from uh, three surrounding schools worked with the team of whoop de doo uh, there, you can look them up online. And they really engaged in students in, this was an after school um, activity where we ran in the gallery that I ran and they created a um, an idea, ran a series of uh, shows that we had um, 750 people attend in different showing. And they created everything from scratch, the content with the help of these two artists. Um, this is the type of things that um, also governors are uh, put a lot of money this year in after school or academic support funding. Uh, in, not, not that I'm saying that arts should be something relegated to after school or in summer school, but the extended opportunities that come outside the classroom walls are something that governors are consistently saying is worthwhile and they're putting money behind that. So this is an example of how I try to do that with my students, having the classroom walls extend beyond uh, the school boundaries. Uh, social emotional learning is critical. Um, as I said, the funding for physical and mental health, access to mental health programs, that was something that my students repeated over and over. And they want school and community-based health services available to students and inform them. Uh, this is a, uh, obviously a response to COVID, but pre-COVID, this was a growing concern for teachers and students and parents. Um, how can we be supportive of their whole needs, not just academic? And even though um, we are not social workers, we do need to, at the schools, have access to that type of support and help. Uh, over and over, I think that was probably the most consistent concern I had for my students is their well-being, uh, what was behind them not getting in assignments, what was going on in their lives. And that I, I couldn't fulfill that role, but increasingly students need to have access to counselors that are taking care of them in these ways. And there, there's resources beyond just a um, meditation room, which is a good start, but I think it needs to be incorporated more thoroughly into the uh, curriculum of each course. Um, here is a project I'm running right now with a colleague, artist, friend of mine, uh, with my graduate students, um, where we're getting out uh, 
using art as a way for people to process things. So the social emotional learning, the arts can really work. This is a uh, program up in Salt Lake called uh, On the Other Side Academy. It is uh, a wonderful project that we've been working with them. And this place uh, deals with people that have been incarcerated, homeless, and, uh, and, and, and uh, substance abusers. And they go to this vocational school and they help them to transition from the life they've had into the life they want. And so we've been, since January, uh, been working with this group doing uh, this, this project of having them express that through these big four feet by eight feet murals that each of these uh, teams, they call them tribes, work together, eight of them that come into the program at different times to work through. This type of um, catalyst is great for every student though, not just those in a type of program like this. And uh, when I ran the gallery, I had my students be conscious of other people by doing uh, classes on Saturdays with the Head Start program. These were free courses for preschoolers and their parents. So this type of social emotional learning, not only for our students, but being aware and committed to the needs of the community helps the students to kind of reflect on their own status and uh, kind of do some self-reflection on where they might be and how they can they can improve their own well-being in these areas. So real world application, uh, again, investment in the workforce is something uh, that the governors um, talked about, but I really wanted to uh, steal from Elon Musk because it's got a lot of money, his private school, uh, at Aster, and I think it's now called SpaceX School, but a lot of it involves the use of technology we'll talk about in a minute. But one thing that I really thought was great is the teamwork that goes on about problem solving, that, that this is something that is going to be helpful in his mind, who's obviously someone who's got that perspective of where perhaps the workforce is going, but um, that educational education should prepare students for that flexibility to be able to be critical thinkers that can problem solve and work in teams. And so this is a real world application that we can apply in our classroom. There's a lot of opportunity, the art ed, uh, art educational classroom where we have the new team projects like I shared with you just a minute ago, or doing murals in the community. That's something that we've done with my students um, or, or art shows. But um, real world application is where it's at and where things are moving and obviously the funding and the policies in place are going to support that movement. Here, uh, a few of my students that uh, help organize and curate an exhibit in a museum. And um, I can't tell you how much uh, feedback I get from these students that still contact me, come by my house uh, now that I'm retired and they've graduated and, and uh, we have a lot of connection because they went through a very meaningful experience doing something that had real world impl implications where they had to problem solve and figure things out, giving them a set of school skills, but uh, helping them to work as a team and learn as a team together was a very, very uh, strong experience for them. Interconnectivity, again, Elon Musk School, it, it, it might be the antennae of where we're going with education or where we should in preparing students who will be entering into a workforce if the the, the um, studies and the data suggest that they will not, they'll be taking on jobs, those are in elementary and middle school, jobs that haven't even been created yet. And so they have to have a skill set to be able to uh, find their own voice in the arts, but also work as a team. And team thinking games or uh, game theory approaches to education might be somewhere we look for models about helping them to be decision makers and communicators and being effective in those realms. Here at another exhibit at the gallery I ran, but again, uh, another example of how that might look, teamwork coming together to solve problems. So fast forward for me, based upon what I've seen with uh, certain things, and I didn't talk about technology. Let me touch upon that just really quickly before I exit. Um, technology is the bane of most teachers' existence, fighting for the attention of students looking at what's cool and hip in Instagram. I don't even know if they use the word hip, so that tells you how disconnected I am. But um, there was a uh, three weeks ago, 
there was a uh, discussion at the Getty Center, online discussion with Jesse Miller, who talks about thinking differently with kids in technology, that we should not um, control the tech, but help them to be able to use it in a meaningful way. So going forward, technology obviously is not going away, but we need to help students learn some, uh, be critical digital citizens and learn how to responsibly engage in the world in and through technology. So that will be something that will each school and school system will have to look at helping the the focus needs to be on the individual child learning uh, how to use technology by and and learning that in a meaningful way that they use it in a way to contribute to the community and use it as a tool to learn, not as something that is distraction. So as, as a creator, not as um, a consumer. So st student ownership, they want some control of that. Uh, improvement in curriculum as teachers, it behooves us to be our very best. Uh, social emotional learning needs to be incorporated in some ways. I'm doing a workshop later on this year on uh, mindfulness. Um, and I know a lot of our teachers are using that as a way to engage their students and also help them to ground in meaningful ways to their mental wellness and, and emotional health. And then real world application is clear from the funding and the trend and the constant request from uh, Lisa's group and my, my students that they want real world pragmatic experiences. They don't want just only abstractions. They want something that can be applied to help them in their life immediately after they graduate, things that they can help to enrich and the quality of life. And then interconnectivity and, and uh, working in teams is a great way to do that. So some questions still how, how, uh, that I don't know that we need to be thinking about. How do we reconcile the new goals with old structures? That's always a problem. Uh, how do we foster innovation by recognizing that we are in a fairly conservative area, education, and also the governments that support uh, that each state has different levels of how conservative they are, but typically their spending is conservative. And then how do we be responsible for all members of the, our vulnerable members of our society and, and taking care of their needs? Some of my students mentioned that as well. Uh, taking care of people, not only themselves, but being aware of others. So I think now it's time for Amy's perspective to let some, uh, give us some insight on where we're going. Right. Thank you, James. And thanks, Lisa. I'm going to share mostly from the first two sections and the last section. You may need to join us in person, uh, just given the time that we have for our recording today. But I'm going to talk about who our pre-service students are. And when I say are those of us who are working as mentors in spaces of higher education, but certainly that's our K-12 educators, too, who are working with our students through field experiences and observation hours, and then thinking about how the past, present, and future unfold in educational settings. Um, I'm really interested in how my students are reconciling some of the things that James and Lisa shared, and we'll just get some snippets of that uh, in, my, in the presentation that I'm going to present. And then if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about how we're thinking about research and where it lives in our field, as James, Lisa, and I are all part of the NAEA Research uh, Commission. So I'm going to rewind um, uh, just a bit. And uh, where was Amy Filer Wonder in 1997? So I was uh, becoming teacher, integrating a love of interdisciplinary studies by studying both elementary education and art education. And uh, just a little story, because I work with narrative inquiry, I was trying to move beyond my one room schoolhouse, that would be the basement of my old farmhouse, and my one student, my sister, um, and worksheets. And I actually stapled together farm implement magazines as a farm girl. Those were what I had access to, to make my worksheet packets. I was very proud of myself. Uh, and as I started studying uh, art education, I was introduced to children and their art. This was the best image I could find. It was hard to find the cover of this book uh, by Michael Day and Al Hurwitz. And I started to think about curricular connections uh, integral to a holistic learning experience for learners of all ages. And uh, similar to James, I created a little timeline, but this one uh, is certainly not complete. And it's a little more of some kind of points of interest in my own story alongside my students. Um, and it's a very brief timeline. 
so of course, uh, as James was sharing, I was uh, studying in the 90s. And so my teaching career started with a very solid foundation of DBAE, discipline-based art education. And I learned to write lessons focused on art history and aesthetics, criticism, and certainly art making using a variety of tools and techniques, including paper making, as Lisa shared earlier. Um, with my elementary teaching background, though, I was also highly interested in using a range of subject matters, most predominantly children's literature. But I would say my lessons were very much teacher directed and focused on the works of masters. And that was in part because I had not seen or been introduced to those works uh, growing up working class in a farming community. Um, and as I continued uh, along a less than linear path in this chart shows, there are experiences that continue to inform my teaching. Uh, for example, through working with Paul, a first grader who was blind for my master's thesis, I became much more attuned to learners' experiences how all the senses informed art making and the importance of student narrative, that their voices, their stories came out in their artwork. As I continued studying teaching learning um, and also learning research methodologies as a PhD student, I was drawn to narrative inquiry. And here I began to examine how working class backgrounds among other identities impacted curricular choices and unpacked how curriculum unfolded in three economically diverse schools in the same district. This work continued through conversations with my graduate students and pre-service students as critical colleagues. And I think what we see from the teachers that Lisa interviewed and then James from his students is really those conversations to be relational with our students and those that we work with to find out what individuals need. And given that my work had looked at intersectionality, I also needed to look at critical whiteness, recognizing that I am part of the predominant teaching workforce as a white educator. Um, so my work uh, has, over the last few years, alongside of my pre-service students, been uh, committed to uh, artography. And so on the next slide, these are some of those uh, areas. Uh, this involves that we are committed to inquiry, to learning alongside of each other. And again, I think we hear that with the students and the teachers that we heard from. What do they need um, and desire to feel that they are active citizens in the world, that their learner needs are met. And it's a commitment to a way of being in the world, to be curious, uh, to learn through art making, to tell your story through art making, um, to negotiate personal engagement in a community of belonging. James's example of the different community projects where ownership was handed over to the students in places like the gallery uh, experience uh, are examples of this and a commitment to creating practices that also trouble and address difference. And those are some of the examples that I'm gonna share uh, from my pre-service students of thinking uh, how the teaching force is changing and needs to change as we represent um, our students and look at historically marginalized groups that haven't pursued teaching and why is that? And how would we and could we support reinscribing uh, who the teacher is? So in the next slide, when I talk about narrative inquiry, this is really paying attention to the past and the present and the future really impact who we are as educators and that we are impacted by the personal and social conditions as James and Lisa shared. How has COVID impacted how we think about teaching? How are the technology uh, needs and futurings that we are not even aware of, right? As they continue to develop at very fast rates, what will that mean for our future educators? And that we are influenced by place and the sequence of events. So today I want to consider the integration of being artist, teacher, and researcher, and what this means for the students that I work with. And I have just two small examples of collage narratives um, in the form of paper dolls created by pre-service teachers, where they're really considering what we teach and how we teach it and who they believe they need to be as teachers and who they desire to be as teachers. And so for this project, uh, I asked them to think about clothes and accessories that would reflect the identities most important to them at this moment in time, and what clothes or accessories would illustrate tensions that they feel in terms of their personal and professional identity, uh, in terms of what the expectations are around being a teacher, what stereotypes exist, and how do you address this as a future professional, and how have personal factors such as class, race, gender, or other identities informed their professional identity. 
And this is centered around the question of how do art teachers develop a critical consciousness on the impact of intersectionality and the views of learners in curriculum development. And I took out development because to me that feels a little bit like a top downward instead of making that curriculum a living being. And again, I think it comes to the examples that James was sharing of creating that curriculum very holistically with students um, very much in mind. And so in the next slide, this is uh, one of my students and I just want you to look at the backdrop and look at the accessories and look at the images that he has selected to talk about his identity, because I think just pausing and taking a moment to look at his choices in clothing and, like I said, accessories, illuminate some of the things that are on his mind in this moment in time as a future teacher. I'm just gonna share part of his writing. And this is where the artist, teacher, researcher comes together. The students were creating images like you see here of who they see themselves as teachers, who they desire to be, pressures that they feel as teachers. They're also writing narratives like sections that I'm showing you, you here, but they're also researchers in that they had read several articles um, related to the teaching field and integrated that into their writings uh, as they develop their philosophy of teaching. So this student shares, my culture and ethnicity are also heavily responsible for my values and beliefs. This facet of my identity was translated through signs and banners I created to represent my activism and passion for equality and inclusivity. This is something I hope to bring to the classroom. And in the next image, um, my student uh, shared this, um, and she was influenced by some writings by Ed Check. In my opinion, love is not a political matter, and it does belong in the classroom. Love and care, and so this gets to the social and emotional aspects that Lisa and James talked about, of one student's does belong in a classroom, the kind of love where one is honored for who they are. Queer people belong everywhere and they deserve to be visible while belonging. So setting a positive example and advocating for my learners, the, their, future, their future students is very important to who I am and who I want to continue to be. So in these very two short examples, um, and here you can see the Kutztown Pride t-shirt, which is very, you know, that's where the student is highlighting um, their identity as part of the LGBTQI community, and then the expectations of professional dress and that being important to them and showing their professional self, but the importance of place and being part of the education program uh, here at Kutztown. And these students gave permission to share their images. So with the collage narratives in the next slide, these are places where, again, students are wrestling with tensions of who they are as teachers. They're thinking about what and how we teach it. They're marking and unmarking chosen or performed identities. They have a desire to amplify voices and uh, to be parts of uh, civic engagement. And I think this relates to James' example of the pre-service students you know, working with individuals in community. And we were also doing that as part of this class. So all of that integrated into the storylines that you just get snippets of, that's the scissors, <laughs> in this presentation. Uh, so I think for my students, what they have talked to me so much about is the importance of relational learning you know, they can access information very easily. They don't want to be told how to be teachers. <laughs> they want to experience it. So very similar to the high school students that we listen to, they want to experience it in the real world. They want to navigate it through the support of a mentor, through being able to have critical conversations um, and to really talk about what was it like when you were a teacher? What do you see now? Those are the, the questions I get all the time. Well, when you were a teacher, what was it like? And what's it like for you now? And what do you think, right? They want to have conversations. They are hungry for dialogue. They're hungry to talk about those real world experiences and to unpack them so that they can really build relationships with students focused on the social and emotional. And so with this, uh, do I have a little more time or should I wrap up? I have a little more time, okay. Uh, so within these critical voices, uh, again, the pre-service teachers were unpacking, right? These kind of in-between spaces. And I think it's the in-between spaces where they're navigating, again, what's happening in schools with, a des with other desires. And the examples that I was hearing from the high school students is, you know, again, the real world experience, um, opportunities to create space to have conversations about mental health. And I just read a research article that talks about 
if others, if students can support each other in asking the hard questions when a student is experiencing some mental health challenges, that is key in students moving through those difficult situations that they feel it's okay to talk about that and that they have that support. And so in those spaces of tension, there's also possibility um, as we imagine teaching, right, but beyond what I experienced, which was sitting in a desk with the teacher as the leader, uh, with the teacher with all the information and uh, a lot of test taking. And I think the art room, of course, creates that space where students can be in these in-between spaces to imagine new possibilities for themselves and for their future students. And so as part of the research commission work, I wanted to just uh, highlight some of the things that we're thinking about as we expand our research network. And I can't help but start from what I know, and that is thinking about my experiences literally in the landscape of growing up in uh, Iowa. I was surrounded by a lot of farmland, and this influenced and still influences my research and teaching. Uh, certainly looking at class, but going more in depth through unpacking layers. Like soil from the surface, it might appear like dirt, but the soil is complex it's a layered ecosystem and research is complex, rich and layered. And we'd like to have you consider where research lives in the field for you. And there's many ways to be a researcher. And I think that's really important work of the research commission. Um, you know, research is listening to our students through the videos, listening to our teachers through the videos, uh, having those conversations influence the work that we do in curriculum. To me, curriculum is, living research. We are constantly in a space of action research in the classroom. So as we fast forward, um, I just wanted to share a couple, uh, couple highlights of what we define as the research network. And this is really the commission thinking about creating connections across researchers and divisions to support synergies that will emerge, expand, and collapse as we learn from membership um, and those in the field. And so one, one way that we think about that is shared inquiry. And these are things like, what are you, what are you researching? Kind of shining the light on things, illuminating things. What is your focus? What do you want to know more about? And so in the student examples, like the one in the next slide, this is again, another paper doll. And she used the bruised knees to talk about how she really believed in the importance of standing up and standing up for her classmates and giving care. And sometimes that meant, um, uh, she said, I'll never get angry or yell, but I want to know that when somebody says something about a student that's not kind, I'm gonna stand up for them. So she was using the little bruises on the knees as a, example of that. And so that shared inquiry is I see the paper dolls as a conversation with my students of what they're navigating with um, as future students. And then, um, and so this relates back to artography is that hopefully as researchers we're folding and unfolding ideas, we're creating new understanding, understandings and in the spirit of the paper dolls, we're seeing and sewing possibilities uh, through research which is art making, which is conversation, which is narrative, and a whole range of methodologies. Um, and so within that, it's really about communities of engagement is another component as we think about the research network, as all those ways in which we connect with each other in the field, how do we build these shared inquiries by bringing ideas together and taking them further? And so one example of this is a, a recent presentation I did with a colleague in the field, Beth Link, who's, uh, we noticed that our projects that are a, a decade apart, a little more than that, had some very shared and common questions that we were asking. And so we took some time to look at that. So I'm not gonna go through all my questions, but I was really, you know, 12 years ago, looking at how socioeconomic status impacted how children construct their identities and how that impacts school culture and the unfolding of curriculum. And Beth has been asking how white elementary art educators enact curriculum addressing cultures that differ from their own and how does whiteness and race operate in white elementary art educators curriculum work. And she had shared a conversation around artwork that she had observed and I had done something similar uh, about 12 years ago. And we had this kind of moment of illumination and seeing how the research continues in different threads um, and different layers. And so one of the things that we discovered through this shared inquiry is that there are still 
a lot of ideologies that still embed themselves within curriculum. And again, how can we bring students' voice uh, into the work that we do? So through that, in the next slide, we talk really about guiding progress and how does uh, the community in which we work within NAEA and our other communities in where we teach and live create possibilities uh, for research that again, attends to the needs of place. And so our shared finding uh, through that, um, I'd already just shared, was thinking about the curricular ideologies. Um, and given that some of those things are still deeply embedded into curriculum, um, how can we create more inclusive practices so that the research that we're doing and the conversations we're having, and again, I think that fits beautifully with the high school students amplifying a need for healthy eating, for uh, mental health, for care of each other through you know, a space for meditation. Um, how do we continue as a field to provide uh, opportunities for inclusivity? And with all of this in mind, as, as my own research unfolds, I think it's important to continue to remember um, that uh, as part of the predominant teaching field, I need to continuously ask where other voices are less visible and how through our work can we continue moving forward to make voices um, heard and amplified. And so then we'll leave you with these questions uh, that we'll just pause so that you can see these. And uh, if you're in person with us at NAA, we'll definitely move into these more. And we hope that you'll put questions in the chat box for us that we can return to. And in the spirit of time, I'm gonna hand it over to Lisa. So thank you so much. Uh, this concludes our presentation uh, online. If you're able to join us in the chat box, feel free to ask more questions there. This is our contact information. So um, if there's uh, any of the three of us or all three of us that you'd like to reach out to, to find out more information, feel free to email us. And I just really wanted to thank Amy and James for joining me on this adventure. And uh, I think it's really nice to see the perspective from the teachers to the students, to the pre-service teachers, uh, to higher education. So thank you so much for your time and we hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Yes, thank you. Woohoo!